had to control my flesh during praise and worship. Because if I went a little longer, then my message can go shorter. <laughs> so uh, the Lord said, no, 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 no. <laughs> but uh, if you would pray with me. Um, Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. And my voice is fluctuating out of nervousness. And I know, Lord, that you yeah. are the one who is here. And you are the one who takes over, Lord. And I ask you, God, to give me a submissive heart for your message that you have, Father God. And I thank you, Lord, for the for the information you've given me. And I ask you, God, to pass it along just as easily to uh, everyone here, Lord. And we thank you, Father God. We just thank you for giving us the opportunity to be a part of your family. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, so... Um, let me just introduce myself, if half of you all don't know me already or know my testimony or where I'm from. I am originally from very deep South Texas. It's about a 10 hour drive almost um, uh, from the city of Harlingen, not to be confused with Arlington. Arlington's maybe about a five hour difference between Harlingen. Um, <clears throat> I was raised in a Spanish-speaking community with two Christian parents, and uh, uh, it's uh, been a wild ride. My parents were saved out of a very bad place, and uh, learning from baby Christians how to be a Christian, uh, there's got to be like some sort of learning curve, I guess, when you're in that sort of situation. And I myself have had my share of dark times. Um, it it's funny how when you were in the world and you like to drink alcohol and God brings you to a state where alcohol is right there in Walmart um, and uh, that's what really shocked me when I came to Louisiana first aside from the accent y'all do have an accent <laughs> I say Sam Sam's and you guys say Sam's and uh, it's 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 a very different world here and praise god that have been taken into a, an amazing family who not only loves the lord but loves talking about the lord and communing with the yes. lord and um it really mm -hmm. is amazing uh you know when as i got older and got into my 30s i you know didn't think i was going to get married because in our culture, you got married at a young age, and I was already 35 years old. And lo and behold, God brought me a Louisiana man. And trust me, I loved all things Louisiana all the time. All the Louisiana shows were recorded on my DVR. Any song having to do with Louisiana, like Blue Bayou, Take Me Back to Blue Bayou, was one of those karaoke songs that I love to sing. So. God said, let's go to Louisiana, the state that you secretly love. Um, <clears throat> one day God asked me in prayer, what if I never gave you a single thing as long as you live? Would you still serve me and praise me? And of course, my answer was, of course. If anything that I had in my life was my salvation and my ability to praise God. And not just from skill because I can sing and I am a musician, but because I have been taken into a family to praise the Lord. So I began to seek his instruction and he began to teach me day by day, week by week. And I have like a weekly lesson from the Lord. And um, it was amazing this journey that God took me on and um, I began to be content with God and I said God if you don't give me anything if you don't give me kids if you don't give me a husband not in that order um, I will serve you to the best of my ability and he said all right let's take it to the next level and he gave me a husband <laughs> so if you don't think that getting married is a challenge it is a challenge um, and they say the first year of marriage is the hardest. And I said, if the first year of marriage is the hardest, then we got a good journey ahead of us because our, our first year of marriage is pretty good. Don't you think, babe? 
We just made a year of marriage on June 17th. Okay. Uh, we got married 6, 17, 17, and 6 p.m. So um, when I met Christopher and we decided to get married, the scripture, Ephesians 3.20, uh, now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us came to mind and it rang true over and over even as we were planning our wedding it rang true over and over god went above and beyond when he provided me a husband and not only because he's a man of god who loves to serve the lord but because the family that was packaged with it <laughs> i'm i'm not over exaggerating when i say i love my in-laws and that is a blessing in and of itself but if you understand the, uh, the, the typical relationship between mother-in-law and daughter-in-law, um, it is not the typical relationship between my mother-in-law. I love her dearly. And if that's not a reason to pray for, praise God for anything, I don't know what is. <laughs> so this, this evening, speaking of praise, we're going to talk about praise. Praising God and not praise and worship. But praising God, oftentimes people think praising, praise and worship is fast songs and slow songs. The praise songs are the fast ones and the worships are the slow ones. And that is not the case. So I got a little bit of vocabulary here for you. Um, God gave me a, something to talk about. He said, he said, you see, sometimes... Humanity can take the praise all for themselves. When you get the good job, when your kids are well behaved, when you, you know, get that raise, you did good, right? When you got a new car and you did it all on your own, you did good. And you're not giving God the praise in that instance. What we're, what's happening is that we're giving ourselves the praise. And uh, we don't want to be uh, the praise receivers when we praise God we want to be the praise givers and God will throw wrenches in our situations to humble us and uh, uh, realize that he's the one who do who does everything and he does he does that through refinement uh, in Proverbs 27 21 as the finding pot for silver and the furnace for gold, so is man to his praise. So God will uh, refine you like a finding pot. Uh, sometimes we give our kids praise. Sometimes we give our spouses praise. Every other person in our life and thing. Um, some of us think we know how to praise. And some of us come to church and do our weekly obligation just to get out. But that shouldn't be the case. We should pray God, praise God all the time, anytime we have a chance, because those kids, that spouse, that raise, those good things that happen are all by God's design. Right. So in myself, I've purposed that I want to walk in a state of praise Never doubting, never unbelieving, always living and giving God the glory. Um, Psalms 86, 12 says, I will praise thee, O Lord, my God, with all my heart, and I will glorify thy name evermore. Praise God. So here's a few words. I'm going to read a few words from the Old Testament and then the New Testament. Uh, words that are used of praise. And as you know, in the Old Testament... Um, the language that was spoken was Hebrew or Aramaic, um, and then the New Testament was Greek. So, some the first word that I'm going to read to you from the Old Testament, and many of you could put, or you can turn your Bibles to Second Samuel two sixteen. Um, and it was told to David, saying, "The Lord hath blessed me in the house of." Over Eom, and all that that pertaineth unto him because of the ark of God. And I will skip to uh, fourteen. Was it first Samuel or second, second Samuel six twelve? Second Samuel did I say first? Six twelve. Yeah. Six twelve. Yeah. Second Samuel six twelve. Um, skip to fourteen. Sorry. 
And David danced before the Lord with all his might. David was girded with a linen. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of trumpet. And as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michal, Michal, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord. And she despised him in her heart. David was a man after God's own heart. He loved the Lord he, from the time that he was young. Uh, God had been grooming him to be king. And um, even though the, the people had wanted Saul to be king, God was grooming David. He had just come in from a battle from the valley of Rephraim uh, against the Philistines in 2 Samuel. So that's why... They were dancing and they were praising and they were bringing the ark in and they wanted to celebrate because God had defeated the Philistines. God instructed David to, to uh, let him defeat the Philistines and he did so. So they were dancing and having a good time. And um, Saul's daughter, she despised David because they were having a good time. Because he won the battle, because uh, who knows why? He, obviously, she, her dad was king, and David wasn't good enough to be king in her eyes. Who knows? Daddy's little girl syndrome. Um, I just uh, wanted to point out that Rephraim uh, means breakthrough. So the Valley of Breakthrough, this was the battle at the Valley of Breakthrough. So God had his breakthrough with David. So David was celebrating. He was praising God. He brought all these other people to praise God and they joined in because God had broken through and they defeated the, the Phil Philistines. If you've ever had a breakthrough in your life, Amen. you praise the Lord. Amen. There's no doubt about it. If you love the Lord, you praise the Lord. Amen. Um, so it says in 2 Samuel. <clears throat> oh, I put the wrong one. So she despised him. Let me look for that. Uh, so when God goes before you and he gives you a breakthrough, nothing and no one should stop you from halal. Halal is the first word that I'm talking to you about. And it means to boast, to clamorously make foolish, to celebrate and sing, to shine, and to make a show. So halal is what we should do when God gives us our breakthrough. When God comes through with healing. When God comes through with that paycheck that you need to pay the bill. When God comes through, you praise him. And that's the first thing you should do. He should have those first praises. In 2 Samuel 6, 20, David returned to bless his household. And Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How glorious was the king of Israel today, who uncovered himself today in the eyes of his handmaidens, of his servants, and as one of the vain fellows shamelessly uncovering himself, and David said unto Michal, it was before the Lord which chose me before your father, Saul, and before all his house to appoint me over the people of the Lord of Israel. Therefore, I will play before the Lord, and I will yet be more vile and contemptible than thus, than you, and will be based to my own sight and the maidservants which thou hast spoken them, and shall I have had honor. There Michal, daughter of Saul, had no child unto the day after her death. So what's happening is that David has uncovered himself shamelessly in front of his handmaidens and in front of his servants, and she wanted to tell him, you're doing the wrong thing. You." You're naked in front of women, you know, like uh, one version said, uh, some vulgar exhibitionist. You see, the world wants to tell us that when we praise God, it's vulgar and it's wrong. That's not where the praise belongs. And, um, <clears throat> and David said, no, 
I'm going to praise God. Whether it looks vile or contemptible in your eyes, whether I, it may look like I'm humiliating myself, I'm going to praise God. Amen. Amen. So how many times are we standing here, are we talking to people who, who uh, don't know Jesus, do we praise God without shame? Whether it's vile or, or contemptible. I don't know how many times I've heard Troy talk about how he's talked to people who don't want to hear the truth. And he doesn't care. He wants to talk to them about the truth of Jesus Christ. Whether how vile or contemptible it is. Um, that's the praising of God. Even other Christians have things to say about you praising God. They think that... Uh, your hands lifted high, or your voice is too loud, or your crying is too much, and you do it every Sunday, every Wednesday. Oh my God, did you see her again? And did you see him again? And it's it's uh, embarrassing, honestly. But people want to praise the Lord unashamedly, yes. foolishly, opening themselves up. Yes. So when I praise God, I just close my eyes and ask the Lord to show me what are the right ways to praise Him. So the people who are sitting there new in the audience um, can see that what I'm doing is out of love for the Lord. And then this love for the Lord can be theirs too. And this unashamedness can be theirs as well. <clears throat> so she didn't celebrate with David either. They won. Those were her people. They were once her people. She was Saul's daughter. They were, she was, she's still a part of that country. And they had a victory. And God delivered them to victory. And she didn't want to celebrate Sometimes when we see other Christians who are, who God is doing things to us, are we celebrating with them? When the praise and worship team comes up, are we celebrating with the praise and worship team with them? So my next word is yada, which is to hold your hands out and to throw your hands and revere or worship and extended hands, which which shows a confession of praise and thanksgiving. So Leviticus 2.4. Leviticus 2.4 says, When you bring a grain offering baked in the oven as an offering, it shall be unleavened loaves of fine flour mixed with oil and unleavened wafers smeared with oil. And if your offering is a grain offering baked on a griddle, it shall be of fine flour and leaven and mix with oil. And Leviticus 23:18. Along with bread you are present you are to present, sorry, seven unblemished male lambs, a year old, one young bull and two ram, uh, rams. As um, and at the end of that scripture it says together with their grain offerings and their drink offerings, an offering made by fire of a pleasing aroma to the Lord. So, yada means to stretch out your hands as if you were offering. These, these offerings in Leviticus were part of the, the, the feast of first fruits. And they were bringing their first fruits as an offering. They were handing over their unleavened offering. So we know that as a, a unleavened offering means that, uh, unleavened means that the bread won't rise. We all know that, right? Um, <clears throat> that, that offering is to be presented with a, a joyful heart. And and a pure heart. That's where the unleavened comes from. Just like the offering that was presented on the cross. An unblemished, unleavened offering that we know Jesus is because of his righteousness. And he's the only one who could be that unleavened offering. Amen. It was lifted up. He was placed on the cross and lifted up. They had to hammer him down and they had to 
lift him up as an unleavened offering to the Lord. So when you lift up your hands here, remember that the same lifting of hands and the offering of praises that you're doing is the same lifting of Jesus Christ on the cross that was offered for your sins. Amen. It's the same kind of offering. It's an unleavened offering. Um, <clears throat> on the unleavened, when the unleavened flour is baked, it doesn't rise. But if there's even an ounce of lemon, leaven, I read in a blog, uh, an ounce, even an ounce secretly put in will make the bread rise. So when you open the oven, you see a risen bread and there's, you know that there was leaven in there, but it, it's not until after it's cooked that you see the leaven in there. So when you bring your offering of praise, make sure it's a pure praise, not a puffed up praise. We are coming and asking for God, well, I, I, I'm praising you because I need that job. I'm praising you because I need my kids to behave. I'm praising you because um, there's something wrong and I went to the doctor. It should come from a pure place, strictly offering it to the Lord, offering your praises and how Amen. telling him how good he is and purity and humility. Um, <clears throat> It needs to be done with sincerity and truth. So when you're offering to God without uh, pride and leaven in you, remember the scriptures, even if it's just one. And tell God how good he is. I often think about the creation of the world. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The heavens and the earth. Like... There's got to be a start to something, and God created it, but he did it with his words, and it came out of him so effortlessly, I guess, and he only did that on one day, the heavens and the earth, let's leave it alone for one day, and let me see that it is good. That's worth praising God for, but because before he created the heavens and the earth, he thought of you. Oh. Amen. And that's worth praising him for. The vastness of the universe, the depth of the earth, the depth of the water, the amount of stars, and he included you before that. And then he went on the second and third and fourth and fifth and sixth day. And the land was good. It was so good. I mean, have you ever been to the beach and you looked at the sunset and you said, wow, that's a good sunset. It's a good, can you imagine anything better than that? Well, there was, there was something better than that. There was no trash on the beach. There was no sticky sand, I don't think. Well, there wasn't sand. He just created the heavens and the earth. Praise God, I hate sand. <laughs> So think of God and your purity, the purity of, of the heavens and the earth when you praise him. So the next uh, word is zamar. And one that's near and dear to my heart, zamar, is a touching of strings or parts of a musical instrument to play upon, to make music accompanied by voice to celebrate in song and music, to strike a musical instrument with fingers, which is what we just did. We all participated in that sort of a praise. And um, I like to think that the things don't get in the way when I get on that guitar, or when I sing to the Lord, or when I put on some music at home and I start singing to the Lord. I, I like to think that things don't get in the way. I'm doing things with a pure and humble heart. Um, Psalms 150. It says, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the trumpet sound and praise him with the lute and a harp. Praise him with the tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. 
Praise him with sounding cymbals and praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. So your, your breath is what is, assists you. The breath that God gave you with life, it assists you in praising the Lord. So you should do well in using it. Amen. I should do well in using it. I pray that God never takes my voice away, but if he ever did, going back to the first sentiment is that if I didn't give you anything, if I took away something, would you still praise me? I want to still praise him. I would find another way to praise him because he's worthy of the praise. Mm -hmm. We use music to celebrate together as a main source of praise. When we go back to 2 Samuel 6, when David and his house celebrated the Lord's victory over the Philistines, he brought everybody in and they brought the ark and they danced and he was naked and they danced and they brought <coughs> food and he fed them. They had a celebration, they praised him. He brought everyone in, he used music to unify them. Oftentimes we might find ourselves using our music as the excuse. Well, I don't have any music so I can do it. I don't know what music to find on my iPod or YouTube, but I, I just couldn't do it. Use your voice. Yeah. God says if you, don't, uh, if you don't praise him, the rocks will. He said that he's, he made the, the earth as a pleasing uh, visual for him. Those will praise him because he designed them to praise him. Do you want to be outdone by a rock? <laughs> I know they have this like new thing where they take rocks and they're like smooth and they start painting them and they put them in their front lawn and people see them in their front lawn, all these painted rocks. And sometimes it's just too many of them, it's too painted and it just takes away from the house. <laughs> well, you are the house of the Lord, you're the temple of the Holy Ghost. You know, if, if ever, you know, there's just me and my husband, we'll just go to the park, we'll stand in front of some rocks. You know, they say, scientists have said, that rocks are like recording devices, they, they absorb sound. So maybe one day somebody will pick up a rock and hear the sound that you, they'll have like a, what, the equivalent of a CD player and they'll plug it in and have a rock and they'll have your conversation. Can you imagine the secrets that rocks could tell? <laughs> I've gone on a muddy trail, but, but, but seriously. But if anything, I could sing to a rock, sing God's praises, and if a person picks up that rock one day and they stick it in their device, they hear the praises that I have to offer God. And maybe it'll inspire them to do the same. And maybe it'll be a witness. All right, this is kind of snowballed. <laughs> <laughs> so we use music to celebrate together. The music is not supposed to be worship. We don't need five guitar players or choir singers with robes. We don't need timbales and I'm being technical, but we don't need a grandbaby piano, even though it might be pretty on the stage. We don't need laser lights. We don't need smoke. Amen. We just need the presence of the Lord in our praises. Amen. Amen. So, so God wants to celebrate him in all things. We talked about his creation um, before the fall. It's beautiful now. Can you imagine what it was like before? You could really look at it and say, God did that. God did that. There's some flowers that we don't even know that are out there. Um, I believe one day in, um, I think it was like Yosemite National Park or somewhere, there was a fire. They set the park on fire. And it was a devastating thing because it was a national park. And uh, they went through the park to see the damage that it had done and they were having cleanup. And then one day, these other flowers started popping up. And they were like purple and blue, and they were—they had never been there before, until the fire. So even in desolation, yes. there's glory. Amen. You know those things that pop up. Um, our praise shouldn't be limited to only our victories. 
the Lord had a victory over the Philistines and, God's, and, and uh, David celebrated. But sometimes we sit here and praise and we only think of the good things of God and, and uh, praise Him because, because of the victories in our life. You know, a friend got healed from cancer. You know, our bill was paid like it should have been. Um, God miraculously uh, spared your house from the hurricane. Those are victories. Amen. Those are victories worth praising, but it shouldn't be the only time you praise Him. The only time we praise Him. <laughs> the, that same God who who um, breathed creation is the same God that put Jesus on the cross. Is the same God um, that appointed that time. But because he had appointed that time, because he was put on the cross, we now have access Amen. to his presence, his glorious presence. The presence of God cannot be unmatched by anybody else's presence. Amen. Amen. Praise God. So the next one, probably not going to like, but it's called, it's Barak. <laughs> Praise God. Barak. It means to kneel in thanksgiving uh, as a salute or an act of adoration. So we kneel in humility and talk about humility. We could open to Ruth 4.4. 4. Ruth 4.4. 4. It's on page 825. I'm just kidding. It's not on a great page. Um, so, Ruth 4.4. 4. And then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a Redeemer. And may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be your be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you is more to you than seven sons and has given birth uh, to him. So, if you know the story of Ruth and Naomi, Noemi, Naomi, um, talk about being on your knees. They had an on-your-knees kind of journey. Noemi lost all Naomi. Sorry. Speaking Spanish. Mm -hmm. Naomi lost all her sons. And she had two daughter-in-laws. And only one stayed with her. And uh, they were about to lose everything. Their, uh, their inheritance, or an inheritance was, was going to go to uh, Boaz. <coughs> who was seen as their redeemer to step in. And uh, the union of Boaz and Ruth brought them out of a loss and gave them more. But Ruth had to be on her knees. She tended to the field and uh, she had to humble herself. She had to be in humility. And when we're on our knees, it's a sign of our humility to God. So, if you can't be on your knees, uh, obviously you find another way to show yourself humble or show yourself in, humili in humility. That's an act of praise. Um, so <clears throat> God sent Boaz as their redeemer. And isn't it like God that when we're on our knees, um, he sends in the redeemer. Jesus became our redeemer. On a, in a time when we were on our knees, when certain death is lurking around us, obviously, if you're not saved, you're headed to certain death and oblivion. You're on your knees in the worst kind of way. But realizing what humility is and being on your knees is when God intervenes. And um, he is a restorer of life. And he is a nourisher. And he is a redeemer. And uh, he should be praised. Amen. <clears throat> In the New Testament, um, my first word from the New Testament is ipainos, which means 
laudation and a commendable thing. When you loud someone, am I saying that? Loud someone, you shout. But Ivainos means to do it in a public kind of way. So um, the same word is in the Old Testament, but it's called Tehillah. Our outward praise to Jesus should be the priority of our hearts. Selflessness over selfish, selfishness. In Romans 2, 28 through 29. Um, it says, this is the Apostle Paul. He says, for, oh, the Apostle Paul is having a conversation with people. They're talking about circumcision. And Apostle Paul responds. So it says, for he's not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew. I'm sorry, I didn't put that. Let me look it up. Sorry. Oh, is it? Okay, but he's a Jew, which is, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart. In the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. <clears throat> so, like I said, Paul is being questioned about circumcision, and he said, circumcision is of the heart. Uh, praise is of the heart. We should express our outward public praise because we were accepted into the circumcision through the cross. So your praise should start from inside. Your praise uh, isn't just a waving of the hands or a kneeling or a clapping or a shouting. It should start from inside. That seems to be the, the theme of all the words. It starts from inside. Um, so through the cross is how we are accepted in, um, by the circumcision. So our next word is doxa. Doxa. Uh, which means glory and splendor, brightness and majesty. 2 Corinthians 3.18 But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass uh, the glory of the Lord, we are changing into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So in uh, Corinth, glass mirrors are not the same as our glass mirrors. We can see a semi-true image, semi meaning you know, coming from your own brain. You might not like what you see in the mirror, but it is what it is. I'm just saying. Sometimes you just approach the mirror and you just got to go and you're like, all right. Um, <clears throat> so back in Corinth, they made mirrors, but they were muddled and muddy and blurry. So uh, the Apostle Paul is referring to the, op uh, the open face beholding as in a glass. As in a glass in those days, they didn't see a true image of themselves in that mirror. So he's talking about not looking at themselves through the mirror. And that we're changed into the same image from glory to glory, even by the Spirit of the Lord. In other words, we not dependent on the mirror, but dependent on the Word of God and what God is telling us who we are. Amen. The image of God that we need to conform to be, not the image in the mirror. And the same could be true today. Our mirrors are giving us a depiction of what we are like outwardly, but you can't see inside. We don't have x-rays at home. Thank God we don't. But outside, we may or may not like, we may or may not praise, or we may or may not boast upon. But inside, if you have Jesus Christ, it is worth boasting upon. That's right. Amen. That mirror image inside of you should reflect the word of God. If you turn through the pages and flip and read chapter by chapter who Jesus is, one day that image will be true. Amen. It's expected to be there because truth be told, one day we may not be allowed to have Bibles. So that mirror image should be true and exact. It shouldn't be like the mirrors in Corinth. <clears throat> so we look at ourselves now because of the cross. We can see ourselves like Christ. 
we can die daily to ourselves like Jesus did on the cross. Um, we can praise God and talk about him and worship him like he did in the cross. <clears throat> Sorry, when I talk about the cross, I actually go to that place. It makes me emotional. We watched Ben-Hur the other day. And uh, watching Jesus be crucified, oof, it was it was terrible, even though it wasn't a true depiction. But he did it. He did it so you can be that mirror image of him and take the message and go out. So do it. Praise him. Be the marriage. Mirror image, be that outward expression, be the doxa. The next word is arate, not karate, but arate, which means valor and excellence. Um, Philippians 4 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are good report. If there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. First um, Peter 2 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, and ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. So the praises of him is arate. And if there be any praise, think on these things, that's adate. Valor and excellent, honest and pure and just and holy and a good report. People should be able to see you and say, that person is a follower of Jesus. They're honest, they're virtuous, and they're a good report. I want to brag on my husband because that's all I heard coming over here. You picked a good one. He's the good one. He's one of the good ones. He sure is good. And then I go back home, where's your husband? Where's your handsome husband? He's so nice and respectful and we love him. It's like, what am I, chopped liver? <laughs> but he reflects the Lord. And I want to thank his parents for doing that. They were fervent in following Jesus. And he took it to heart. And um, he does reflect Jesus Christ. Now, there are some days, and we are not perfect, that he does not put his cross on his shoulder and walk with it. <laughs> but they're very few and far between. So, so, arate, I see that in my husband very often. Uh, Yulo heo, or Yulo geo, is to speak well of and praise and celebrate, which is what I just did about my husband. Uh, Matthew 21 9 and the multitudes that went before that followed cried saying Hosanna the son of David blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord Hosanna in the highest the same instance happened uh, in John's account John 12 13 took branches of the palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. We can speak well of Jesus because he died on the cross. We can speak well of Jesus because he took our sin. This eulogio, which is eulogy, as Matt pointed out to me yesterday, eulogy is, is uh, the way we speak about the Lord. When you're standing here and your hands are lifted up, just talk about the good things that he is. He's the creator of the universe. He's the word of God. He's truth. He's salvation. He is light. He is life. He is love. He brings light to the darkness, as the song says. Most of our songs speak true about Jesus Christ. He's uh, the one who steals the waters. He's the one who restores my soul. Amen. Amen. There's no limit to the words that you can speak about the Lord. Amen. It's there in a book. It's there in each of the books of the Bible. <laughs> uh, so, Yuluheo is how we speak about Jesus. <clears throat> but, 
according to Psalm 106.2, we are never capable of giving God all the glory and the praise that he deserves. There's not enough that we can say to repay what he did on the cross for us. That blood was priceless and pure. The spirit that he brought to us is good and peace. God the Father is good because he made things good. He made us good. There's there's nothing, there's no amount, like I said, there's no amount of words that we can give God that reflects all the glory. So, when you think of your stumbling blocks, when you think of those trials in your life, think about the Lord and all that the goodness that he's bestowed upon us. The cross is number one. I go back to um, uh, Proverbs 27, 21. As the finding pot for silver and the furnace for gold, so is a man to his praise. So that word praise uh, in Proverbs is mahalal, which is fame or pride of self. So... When you start praising yourself, think about the finding pot that God brought you through, the silver and the gold. The thing, is, the thing about finding pots is when you put the silver and the gold in, they have to detract the impurities. So uh, Isaiah explains how the finding pot works. So what they do is they take the finding pot and they put the silver or the gold, the precious metal in there. And then they heat it up to melt. So it's believed that the impurities rise to the top. But as Isaiah explained, they throw in other metals like alkali or lead or tin. So when they throw in those other metals, the impurities stick to the alkali, the lead, and the tin. And they fall to the bottom, and as as much as they're putting the the tin and the lead and the alkali, it starts to rise. So, um, what do you call it, mass, mass distribution? As, as much as you put in, the, it starts to rise. Think about a cup of water, and you put some ice cubes in it, and the, cup, and the water starts to rise. So that's what's happening. So the, the, think of the other metals, the alkali, the lead, and the tin as your trials. And think about the impurities as your sin. Sometimes our sin doesn't come out until our trials, until we're being tested. And then the gold rises, and then it overflows, and um, the refiner can pour the precious metal into a mold to be displayed, like a necklace or a gold statue or something. But it's not until the impurities are taken out. It's not until the other metals are being thrown in. Sometimes God is throwing trials in your life because he wants to get rid of the, to make you aware of the impurities in your life. So the precious metal can rise and then he can have put you in another mold the mold of Jesus Christ Amen. the guy who we're, we're supposed to be like the guy, the man who walked the earth the creator of the universe, the word of God not just a guy, right? Amen So when you think about your trials and the impurities that are coming out with your trials that are being, they're, uh, being attached to the impurities think of the garden Think of the flood, think of Sodom and Gomorrah, think of Moses and the Israelites, and how confounded you are that God intervened every time, but they still cried and complained because they wanted proof of him and his work. So the cycle continued over and over, and God still gave them mercy. 
Then you go back to the cross and how we sin every day, knowing what Jesus did for us and how the cycle continues in our life. But God had intervened through the cross. With Jesus, we have daily correction to help us, us dying day to be refined by him. And that is a reason to praise. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus.